Hey, I'm Juliette Funt, and I'm about to have a productive conversation with Mike Vardy. Oh, boy. This is a conversation that I didn't know that I wanted to have until I, I got into Juliet's work and realized I needed to have it. Juliet Funt is a renowned keynote speaker and tough love advisor to the Fortune 500, who's regularly featured in top global media outlets, including Forbes and Fast Company. She's a white space warrior. We're going to get into that during this conversation. And she's also the founder and CEO of the Juliet Funt Group, helping business leaders and organizations to unleash their full potential by unburdening talent from busy work. You do not want to miss a single moment of this conversation. So let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Juliet Funt. I'm so happy to bring it to you on a productive conversation right now. Juliet, I want to take a minute to thank you for being on the podcast and, <laughs> and, and, and to putting this book together because I think this is a book that a lot of people, there's, 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 there's a few books that have come out lately that I'm really gravitating towards. Oliver Berkman's mm -hmm. got a new book out called 4,000 Weeks. It's phenomenal. Yes, uh, I keep hearing about that. Uh, 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 Indistractable by Nir Yell, who's been on the podcast. Um, but when I went through this, I'm like, yes. Like it was a, a big um, sigh of relief because we're seeing more people talk about this kind of thing. And there's nobody that I've seen talk about white space and room to breathe and taking the pause. Than you, so mm. I'm really glad to have that conversation. Yay, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that struck me right away out of the book, and I, I don't like to reveal too much in a book, especially stories, but when you were telling the story about starting a fire, uh, it, it, uh, I'm a city guy too, so my wife <laughs> is from the Yukon, and so, oh. yeah, so, so she's good at she's it, good, yeah, I mean. <laughs> To survive and so no, I'm just no. But I, <laughs> she's from a cabin in the backwoods they, without running water. They they have a cabin in the backwoods. They have running water, but they have an outhouse. So I mean, which we mm. go there. It's quite lovely. But uh, to go uh, when I when I was reading about that, and it, it harkened back to the time where I was like learning how to start a fire. My wife and, and my mother in law put the fire together. I'm like, oh, that that idea of fire needing space, right? To be mm. able to really, um, it got me thinking about. Uh, the, the the putting the fire together, you think it's got to be all this stuff that'll let the fire, like that'll spark the fire. And when it comes to the things that we want to do and the things we want to accomplish, by cramming so many things in, we think about quantity, right? Like getting as much, but it's that space, right? So can we touch on that right out of the gate? Because I think a lot of people get so into yeah. it, let's do, 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 instead of like, wait. Let's have that pause. Let's have that space that we need. That's actually the foundational metaphor of all of the work is that you have a spark within you and I do and everyone does. And we need oxygenating passages for that space to ignite. And if we don't have them, that's when engagement falters and we're exhausted and we can't seem to touch any meaning in work because it feels so far away. <clears throat> because as you said, we're just going and doing and doing. And this this general idea of stopping and addressing the fact that work is not a pie eating contest is a, a critical thing that you must talk about before you move to how to have a productive day. That macro philosophy of more is not the answer, I, I think has to be unpacked in a really purposeful way by individuals and teams before they can even talk about tips or tools or productivity. Well, and one thing that you brought up again early on in the book, and you you uh, you cited it because you had an interview with um, uh, the author, uh, or with the person who came up with it, um, and I'm it's escaping me right now. But as soon as I mention performative busyness, yeah, that's Juliet B. Shore. Oh, I love her. Uh, uh, but but so that's that phrase, right? Perf well, you just glanced over it, yep. so let's make sure they hear it. Yep. Performative busyness. Yes. That's what we do all day long. It's it's one of my favorite pieces in the book. Well, and what I love about it is that so many people have said, well, it's expected of me. It's expected mm. of me. They, they're they making me this way. They, they, they. And there's a line. There's a line where it says, like, it's no longer they anymore. It's now become, we've become acclimatized. It's just, it's, it's it, you can't say, you have to take responsibility for it now. It's no longer just somebody else that's saying, this is the way it is. Like, no, 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 no. We, it, it, it doesn't quite cop out that way. Can we talk about that a bit? Because I think that there's some type of work that goes on there for sure. I think we should. I mean, to a certain degree, you always have to acknowledge the worker in a giant company 
who feels completely like a passenger on this ship that someone else is designing and driving and directing. And that's that's not a false reality. Right. That's not something that they're pretending. But the amount of agency that we have over our busyness is is incredible. In fact, there's a graphic that we didn't put in the book. Okay. I wanted this in the second to last chapter of the book, and it was the 12 most important things in the book that you could actually tactically do mm -hmm. to create a more easy work style, and which of them you could do completely on your own and which of them you re required team or company buy-in. And it was right. 12, and it was 10 of them you could do 100% on your own, and two of them you did need a little bit of team or cultural acknowledgement to make easy, but it's 10 out of 12. So there's huge areas where we can start on our span of control, our own inbox, our own values, our own belief systems, our own desk. There's so many places to start mm -hmm. before we get to the corporate mothership is ruining my life. And, and that's, you know, that's in there too, but we have a lot of steps to take first. I want to talk about insatiability because you've, you've divided the book up mm. into some interesting parts. And what I like is uh, it's right out of the gate. You're, you talk about insatiability and then we, we're going to get into the white space because I think that's huge. Um, what when it comes to insatiability, how how does someone kind of keep at bay the things that again, that idea of we've got to do as much as possible as opposed to the things that are really going to satiate the things that are really going to mm -hmm. kind of fill our cups. I think that that filter, I think is really important. You touch on that. Um, can we dive into like that, that insatiability, how it can be a curse? Cause you get into that a, yes. quite a bit. Yes. Matthew Fox was um, a writer who wrote a book called The Reinvention of Work. And he said, people want work where they can serve others with their labor and where they can dance their dance. And that's all we want is we just want to serve and dance. We want to wake up in the morning with that little spark that is our contribution, our meaningful talent. And we want to walk in and we want to see it blossom into something that at the end of the day, we went, wow, that had meaning that moved a needle that helped a person. That's the goal of work. And we don't. We end up, we walk in with our spark, mm -hmm. we are assaulted by an avalanche of crap, and we wade through emails and meetings and decks and reports all day long. And then at the end, some moment comes around six, maybe seven, where we look up at the ceiling and say, did I do anything today? Yeah. Did, I, did I get anything done today? So that, that is a result of a basic misconception of confusing activity with productivity. And because we have kind of an insatiable feeling that more is better and that productivity should look like a fast forward movie of some character zipping around from thing to thing, mm -hmm. we confuse the motion with the result. And if I sat, if you and I sat in a conference room and we got in there at 830 and we had some Danish and we took out legal pads, and we put away all of our technology and we sat quietly until five o'clock and at 449, one of us had a gigantic idea that was game changing. That would have been an incredibly productive day, but not at all an active day. Right. We just we just don't understand those two dichot that dichotomy. And if we did, we could start unpacking that insatiability is really about something else. It's about professional anxiety. It's about showing off. It's about walking into someone else's value system that we haven't really questioned. There's so many pieces to that that have nothing to do with producing. Productivity is to produce something of value. And insatiability can take us far, far off field. It reminds me of a time, because I know when I was looking through your bio that you did some work with Costco. You've spoken. And I came oh, from yeah. Costco. I actually worked at the warehouse level, though. So that would, that's what brought me out west. I ran the, at the warehouse level, I ran both the service deli, where you get the rotisserie chickens, and the hot oh. dog area, where you get the hot we dogs. We have to talk about the chicken in a second, because I have to know what's in it, that something is in that that makes it taste different. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Well, well I'll, I'll tell you, it's, um, at least when I was there, it was- Sugar. Uh, well, no, it was Sprite. We would, we would put some Sprite on it to kind of give it that bit of uh, there. There's salt in you put a, a teaspoon of salt in the actual you know like the cavity, but we mm. would we would we would give a little bit of Sprite to it, which was helpful because I was in charge of the food court, so I was able to grab some of that. But that would be one of those things that you would do. I don't know if they do that anymore, uh, but that was one of the things that anyway. Um, so there you go, a little 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 behind Costco, the, back, know, to little Costco back, yes. back to Costco. Yes. So so when I was running the service deli, we had. Um, the, 
there's occasionally sales where they would do these big coupons where you get the coupons in the mail and it's like chicken ball pie is going to be on sale. And you had to get really creative because you knew that there would be more people buying chicken pot pies than you could possibly produce. So you had to get really smart about it. But one year they did these little pieces called salmon tips. And they're these little pieces that you'd put on on bagels or whatever. And I remember that we were we weren't we weren't a very big service deli where where I worked. And what we wanted to do was kind of show and increase sales. And I remember like we went through all the producing throughout the course of the day because that's what you're doing. And then there was a, a time where I had enough people and I could go and I sat in the office and I came up with this. I remember walking past the meat department where they had the fish cases, where they keep the fresh fish, these big blue things that look like pallets. And mm-hmm. I said, what if we took, we, what if we borrowed those? And use those and put them in there instead of putting them in the traditional deli cabinets where people would be looking. And then I talked to one of my managers about it, who also we were both just kind of chilling again, like that Danish. We're sitting in the break room having a coffee. He goes, what if we put it at the front of the warehouse? Like as you walk Mm. in these things, I'm like, yeah, can we do that? He goes, yeah, we did that. And we were number one for sales and salmon tips in Western Canada because he did that. Now, that may not sound like a lot. It's a big like, wow, big deal, Mike. But. We would never have done that if we didn't not just take the time to sit aside, but had the mental space, the bandwidth to be able to do it. And it brings me to the old John Cleese idea of the two things you need to be truly creative are time and space. You have so Mm -hmm. much time, but no space. You feel constrained. You have so much space, but no time. You feel rushed. Um, In the book, you talk about these pauses, right? And the pause comes up, the white space. And what was interesting is that you do have a diagram in here where it shows like early on in the book where it's like we had these breaks, but then what did we fill it with, right? So can we talk about the importance of of the pause, but also making sure that they're 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 used properly, that they actually can result yes. in something. So there's so much to cover there. I know the I- <laughs> the idea. So there is one element that's missing in modern work that the entire book is about. And if we had it back, everything would feel different. We would feel calmer. We would have ease and we would touch meaning every day. And that's the space you're talking about. Mm. We call it white space because in the old days of executive coaching, when I would look at a paper calendar of an executive, I'd be looking for how much white space, literal white. And we knew from watching patterns that that white space was an indication of how much possibility that day could hold. And you see throughout the book, there are examples of if you show me a really productive, amazing leader who's achieved great things, they take this kind of space for granted. Jeff Weiner, who has blocks he calls nothing on his calendar, Phil Knight, who had a chair that was in his living room that was only for daydreaming. Mm-hmm. And leaders who build space in, you'll notice you didn't have the idea about the salmon tips sitting in a meeting about salmon tips. No, no. Or, or, had or the, a status meeting that we normally, it was, it was a, there, there was no expectation. I think that's the right. key thing, right? And you were moving, you were doing the old managing by walking around because yep. you had space. And so you saw the blue pallets. And so this kind of ideation that comes from space feeds the fire and not just, and this is so critical, not just in the sense of our recuperating, because when most people think of white space, the first thing that comes in their mind is rest. They think I need space so I can go, ah, oh, I'm so exhausted. I'm so burned. I need to just stare at a window for a while. But that's only 25% of the way that professional people use space in the day. They also use it to ideate, reflect, create, construct. Uh, One of my favorite stories in the whole book is a guy named John, who's a security guard. You might remember this story. But he, he is a security guard which means that 5% of his job is assigned to action and 95% is waiting to see if anything happens. And in that waiting, he has actually created so many patents. He's a very creative thinker, but he's created so many patents that he has the number one patent record in his company, which is a Fortune 200 company that prides itself specifically on patent creation. And and the, the nuances of that story that I love to highlight, first of all, are no one is judging the validity of thinking in his day. That he is using thinking because he has all this space, but no one's sitting there going, what are you working on? What are you working on? What are you working on? While he's trying to follow 
amuse. Mm-hmm. There's nobody interrupting him doing that. The other punchline of the story is that twice he was promoted into the innovation department because they saw this amazing track record that he had and he tried, but he found that the jobs he was given were actually preventing him, literally preventing him from being creative. And two times now he has been voluntarily redemoted back into security because Inside innovation, he has to do too many tasks that aren't really free. Right. And and so when you think of white space, you're going to think of the busy day and then the pauses in the day that are going to be interlaced. It's really important to understand that they, yes, they are for rest, but they're also for a lot of other things. And, and you mentioned filling. So let me just touch on that briefly. Sure. Imagine the days the moments of the day, like a set of piano keys that are touching, and we want to open them up and interlace them so there is space, not just a 30-minute chunk, which is kind of executive-style white space, but 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, manageable, interlacing, oxygenating space in the course of every single day. And we, we have a problem, which is when we do that, we have intense impulses to fill the open time intense impulses. If we see a block on the calendar that's unfilled, if we finish a project and we sit at our desk and we think we should take a little space, we instantly reach for the phone because we have no idea how to sit in that moment. Or I'm sorry, we're on a podcast, but podcasts become for me a primary filler. If I have three minutes while I'm folding laundry, those AirPods go in and I'm podcasting away, but it's all preventing us from understanding that when we step into the real space, that all sorts of things are waiting for us, that our minds, they're just queued up outside the door, ideas and insights and revelations. And there we are too busy to hear it. And so it, I, as you can see, I'm incredibly passionate about this one simple shift, but it really is if we could make it, it changes everything. As you're discussing this, I want to not not sidebar it a bit, but time blocking. So mm. yeah, so I... Time blocking is, I think, speaking of like we talked about the curse of, of insatiability, time blocking, I think, is a valuable strategy when used correctly, but I think a lot of people can hyper schedule, I think. Yes. Oh, uh, man. Right. So um, how I, w- I would love to hear your thoughts on time blocking, especially since Cal like blurbs the back of the book. And I know Cal yeah. has some thoughts on blocking as well. There's I think that, that I, I just like to get your perspective on it because I have definite thoughts on the flexibility that you need within if you're going to time block as opposed to just this is what I'm going to do during this time. Can we can you touch on that for a little bit? We should, because I've duked this out with Nir as well, who when I read Nir Ayal's book, I, there's actually a sentence in the book that says purposely remove all white space from the calendar. Yep. And I called him and I said, is that really what you meant? And uh, he said, by the way, that he believes in blocking thinking time on his calendar. Yep. But I think I might be a little bit more of a missionary for the improvisational and fluidity of that calendar. That's why I don't use the term time blocking. Mm -hmm. I use the term time sketching. Yeah. Yeah. Because I want it to be in pencil. Mm -hmm. And this is why if you look at alternative education, you look at where children go to schools where they don't have to be yanked out of a subject at the call of a bell Because what if they're right in the middle of discovering yesterday, my 13 year old found something called a monkey orchid. And in his. Oh, what is that? You have to Google it. (laughs) You have to Google it. It's an orchid that looks. I wonder if I I could screen share it at the time. But you have to you have to look it up. It's an orchid that looks like a monkey's face. Wow. Wow. Okay. so then he became incredibly fascinated about orchids and he was looking at stuff on orchids. And we started watching a Richard Attenborough thing on the oldest plant that I've Now, in traditional education, the bell rings and now, sorry, pack up those beautiful thoughts and it's time to move on. And that happens in time blocking also, where if I'm writing an article and I've given myself an hour to write, it would be it would be tragic if the top of the hour caused me to stop a flow of good writing because it's time to do sales or something like that. So time sketching, if I think of it as with a pencil. It means that I'm constantly redesigning the day through the course of the day. I do make a block of what I want. And then the critical rule that we teach over and over and over because meetings drive our day is never let the colors touch. Mm -hmm. If you imagine the color blocks on a calendar, you should see stripes. There should be white stripes in between every color 
time to, I mean, I could unpack, there's all sorts of things that happen in those white stripes, but having them is the beginning. Well, I mean, and it's simply because, I mean, you think about it even with, uh, and I talk about this with email, different email accounts means you use different voices, right? So being able to go, Hmm. so I think that like, if I've got a, uh, for example, I've got the hello account and then I've got the mic account. Well, the hello account is likely a cold person where if they have my email, it's going to be a little bit of a different cadence, a different timbre, maybe to the voice Hmm. or the prose that I use. It might be. Um, but the same thing happens with like if I'm uh, I rarely I think it's happened on a few occasions, especially after summer doing podcast interviews. I want that space there because even though I'm going to be doing the same type of activity, it's a different conversation. It's a different. Mm-hmm. So I need that that time to breathe. I need that space. Right. And what I like about time sketching is that, like you said, there's that flexibility. I, I theme my day. So I give every day a theme. And then that way, like circus night, or yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> so today, I want to know yeah, what the yeah. theme is. So, so today is today actually is is training day. So I like I will try to gear my activities towards training, whether it's training others, training myself. But when we hmm. booked this, it was my media day, which is podcast video. So hmm. my brain is wired for that. But then what happens is if I have a meeting, well, the meeting is it pulls me out of it. But then when the meeting's done, my brain doesn't go, well, now what? My brain goes, no, what day is it? Oh, it's Tuesday. Tuesday is is training day. Okay, what training task hmm. can I do? So I look at the calendar more as a directory for my days as opposed to like the de- definitive actions throughout the day. And then the to-do list offers the details. I think those things, for me at least, they they need to they, they need to work symbiotically. And hmm. I think I, I know that when um, – I know there's some people that are like, I live and die by the calendar – and then there's others that everything goes on the to-do list, but the calendar's often white. I think they need to they need to work together to a degree. They do, and there's a, there's an underlying problem in our psychology, I think, that fuels some of the conflict that you're describing, which is, I think that we're starting to think that we are robots. And I I, I I was looking at a CAPTCHA screen the other day as I was clicking the box. I am not a robot. I am not a robot. I thought we should just have to click that every morning <laughs> just to remind ourselves that this precise kind of, I think of a Vegas dealer, like this quality in time management now where you show up and then you time block and then you transition and then you write your, you know, it's too much. Mm-hmm. We're human beings. We're fluid and messy and sometimes my child is going to come in and sometimes my mind is going to space out and sometimes I'm going to be hungry and there is not enough of that in the definition of productivity and productivity is getting tighter and tighter and tighter as we try to combat the challenges in front of us and I think that the new productivity as we go forward is going to have to be spectacularly gentler just in that same soft, loving, um, real way that we all behave toward each other in the first two months of the pandemic, mm-hmm. where everybody was frail and kind, this is going to have to be part of productivity now, too, because we are not robots. Right, right. And and what I think is fascinating about work that you do, Cal, uh, again, near. I mean, all of us are exploring t- productivity from a different vantage point because, I mean, if you've mm-hmm. been in the space for a long time, you see it. I mean, and and... It's interesting because you said productivity is getting tighter and tighter. It's like the grip of quantitative productivity yep. is being like, but we can see this. We can touch it. We can count it. Inbox zero. Great example of that. Like I got through all my emails today. That must have been a productive day. I'm like, really? Was it? Like, was it? Was or, it? You know, and whereas qualitative, this is the kind of stuff that's going to, th- that's humane, like as opposed to the inhumane stuff that we're, and what's interesting is when you talk about the thieves of time in your book, all of these things, they're qualitative to a degree you know what i mean like they're they're they're, they affect humans robots Mm -hmm. don't get impacted by you know drive or excellence or information can clog them up but it's only as much as the technology can handle an activity can we talk about the thieves of time because i think first off a couple of them i think are probably pretty i wouldn't say uh under well understood by people or at least they're they're recognized but they're probably not very well understood. They're like, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, I get it, but how? So can we touch yes. on those? We will. And let's give them some context first. Sure. My personal definition of productivity is that in the course of a day, I have made something better, bigger, or more beautiful. Love that. So I have to see a before and after experience. It was a thousand pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Now it's a golden retriever. It's important that I have kind of a before and after experience. 
most productivity doesn't have that. We're so busy not letting things get broken or fixing problems. That's that, that thing at the end of the day. So the thieves take us off of the true north, often of better, bigger, and more beautiful. They are so that your listeners know them, drive excellence information and activity. And the reason that they're thieves is that they are assets that have a tendency to overgrow. So in their, in their perfect state, they're assets, but drive becomes overdrive. Excellence becomes perfectionism. Information becomes information overload and activity becomes frenzy. And the thieves like us to stay busy, checking off small wins and doing easy, stimulating activities all day long That is not how you get to better, bigger, and more beautiful. If you want to see a before after experience and something that you've worked on that it's better when you finish it, then you have to be very purposeful in avoiding the thieves. So a lot of the book deals with what exactly are the strategies. We use these questions over and over and over to disarm the thieves, to become objective about the thieves, and to give yourself power over them. As you bring this up, I can't help but think of the the phrase that came up when getting things done kind of reached a real height of popularity with the idea of polishing the runway, right? Like the four mm. horizons of focus and people are just spending a lot of time polishing the runway. It's the small things. They never really get into the sky. They're just spending so much time. Yeah, and I like that, that. That's those small wins. Can we, oh man, the, so much that I want to get into, but one of the things that I, I really love is just the the title of the book says a lot. A minute mm. to think. How do you give someone the understanding and the the know-how and and the the even the comfort of knowing that it's okay to take a minute to think because i think i mean i've done this exercise in in my talks where i've said we're going to do absolutely nothing for a minute and we we don't and i mean i've i've got some improv and stage craft background so i will like shift and and you could see people they're like uh uh-huh. like they they're like it, it must be almost over <laughs> And right. very rarely do I actually do the full 60. I do like 40. Right, right, right. Like I, I used and, to do that too. Right. And it's like, because no one really understands how long, like a minute is a long time when you're actively in it, right? Like when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're you know, you, most people don't realize there's a lot of power there. So can we get into that? Because I think a lot of people go, I don't have a minute to think. Like, what are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. And that's the problem with what sounds like if I, first of all, there are different categories of taking a minute. If I could have had a little sure. Santa scroll that would have come down from the front, it would have said, or breathe or ponder or plan or create or be a human. So there's just, we just want to give you permission to take a minute. And that sense of, we often only get to, can I just take a minute when we're angry or fried or really frustrated, that phrase comes out of our mouth like, I just need a minute. But that's because you really needed a minute six months ago (laughs) and you haven't been able to take one and take one and take one. So that it's so important to understand that there's not a prescriptive nature to that title. If you take three seconds, five seconds, the getting things done, people would like, could you please tell me exactly the duration of, you know, that's uh, right. Yeah, (laughs) That's not my, pick a different, you know, writer. That's not me. But that sense of I need space interlaced, and this is the key word, interlaced in the day, not just in a scheduled chunk. It'd be great if you had some scheduled white space, but interlaced. I finish a task. I'm about to pick the next one. I take a minute to think about what actually serves me best to pick up next. I get an email that has an emotional quality in it and throws me off my game, and I take six seconds to feel that feeling so that I can move aside from it so that I can have lucidity in my brain and have a craft a good response. These, these little interlaced moments of time are what we're talking about. And that's really accessible for people. Everybody can do that. Now, the reason that your participants were so uncomfortable in that exercise is that space doesn't remain empty. And this is one of the biggest misconceptions to talk about. If you take a poker to a fire and you lift one of the logs up and create a space, the flames will immediately lick into that space. It doesn't stay empty. And I I was on the phone on a podcast interview with Guy Kawasaki. He said, so what about at home? What do you just, I just sit there with my wife and I just, and I, Guy is really brilliant, but he's been kind of a fun devil's advocate for me. And I said, no, you don't just sit there. What happens is that when there is space, then rich and wonderful things come into the space. Ideas, thoughtfulness, creative creativity at work, at home, 
all sorts of delicious, joyful activities that we don't have enough time for can improvisationally show up. I remember I haven't worked on my model train or cooked for fun or read fiction in so long. So this frees people to experiment with white space because making it stay empty sounds more like a meditation practice that has instruction to it. That is not what this work is about. It fills, but it has to be open in the first place to fill with better stuff. Right, right. And I noticed that as I've gone through my journey with productivity, and it, you, I would say I started with the let's get as much done as we can. Let's be, let's, mm. and the definition has shifted to the point where it's like, it's about getting the right things done, and you can't get the right things done if you cram your day, your time with so many things because there's no way for you to even know if those right. are the right things. Right. And it's, um, I think, you know, one of the things that I really liked about the book, other than, and, and by the way, if you read Oliver's book, he's going to talk about Busy Town in it. Richard Scarry's okay, Busy great. Town. Because so, <laughs> again, it, it, it's just when you get these different perspectives, and that's what I love about the book, because it brings a different perspective uh, in that it's supporting things that not only that you've been talking about in your work, but there's others talking about it. So the voices are getting the, the noise that we've had about productivity, the way it was or the way it has been. Yep. The other voices are starting to get louder and louder, especially. And I mean, I talked to another guest about this before. Yes, we've been going through the pandemic. We're still in it. But any most of the things that have happened within the pandemic, such as remote work, all those things, they've just been accelerated. They were on their way. And I think this is just another example of that. And let's unpack that a little bit too, sure. because uh, uh, don't blame COVID. No. I, I've been doing this work for 22 years, going into teams that are so fried, they can hardly stand it. So we, we have to just be so careful that we don't make a temporal association with the negative um, forces that we're fighting. This is not only pandemic related. I think the pandemic has thrown a really frightening extra layer. Yes. Really, really frightening. And I think we're going to have to work very hard to undo the norms that we've acquiesced to mm -hmm. during this period as the workday has expanded, as meetings have expanded. Talk about not being a robot. People are just going to break. But it's so important to acknowledge that this has taken decades to get us to where we are right now and that the stats about busyness were terrible before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and the interesting thing is the things that have been helping us through this are the human things, the humane yes. elements. And so if we can add that humane element to productivity, which is what you're talking about in this book in so many ways, um, I think that we're going to be And let me just throw place. in sure. one more thing, which is that interstitial piece I come back to over and over, what leaders who have heart are doing right now is they're giving their teams a wellness day. Some of them are giving them a, I just read an article about wellness weeks are mm -hmm. starting to happen now. It's really good and it's totally from the right place, but it's kind of a little bit analogous to taking a starving person and giving them a binge once a quarter. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. So it is the interstitial presence of space. And you talked about permission. I was editing the book and we do this thing where we, go through and look for repeated words because sometimes as an author you have a word you love and you say spectacular too many times or whatever your love it, word interesting. is interesting you've probably heard me say you know what's interesting interesting i say that yeah. a lot <laughs> i just said unpack twice but we the the word permission mm. is in the book 31 times and i went to the editor and i said that obviously i gotta start thesaurusing that one right and she said no permission and permission and permission this is what we need is for it to be normal to stop, to breathe, to think, to step back. When it's normal, everybody can do it without fear. Yeah. How, uh, as we get close to wrapping up here, I want to ask a, a quick question about certainty. Because um, one of the things that I think I've done, and going back to the theming of my time, for example, is like every Tuesday I know that that's what that day is. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm engineering or manufacturing some level of certainty throughout my days. And... I'm not fighting against that because I think a level of certainty gives that comfort and allows a place for space to live, right? So that, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to look at my to-do list, go, oh, I didn't get it done today. When's the next natural day? Because for most people, mm -hmm. the next natural day would be tomorrow. For me, it's like, oh, it's the default day isn't tomorrow. Uh, do you think that when it comes to the, the, we need both certainty and uncertainty, but when it comes to some of the stuff you're talking about in here, a good deal of it, actually, that 
creating or cultivating some certainty around these things can be helpful? Or do you think that it's something that might be misguided? Like it might be misguided to try to look for that certainty or to try to engineer that certainty around some of like for example the the spaces remember we talked about the spaces like mm -hmm. i'm gonna leave gaps and oh no they're filling with things that shouldn't they shouldn't fill with right oops that was a engineering failure of sorts mm -hmm. so uh, can we touch on that a little bit do you have any thoughts on that it's like ke kettle corn so kettle corn is good because it's sweet and salty mm -hmm. and and that that coming together of two things is a really good thing so that sense of i can be certain and i can be flexible is something that we need definitely in our use of space. But I think that we need to err a little bit more now on the side of certainty because there's so much ambiguity in every other area of life right now that if we could find three things that we're going to say, I'm going to non-negotiably give myself space in three places, it becomes like a handhold. And sometimes those baby steps places of where to take space can be so gentle and accessible. My favorite sip of white space is the very first moment when between opening my eyes and getting out of bed. Just to take a second to orient myself to the day or to sit down at my desk and take a second to orient myself to the professional day, this is manageable for people. Little tiny tricks and tools like every time your computer or your phone is restarting to not do something else during that time and just take a little sip of forced space at that moment. Or I have one, I love to use the hand dryer in a public restroom instead of the paper towel because I, I got to sit there for 40 <laughs> seconds and that wonderful forced experience of space. So I'm talking about manageable, tiny training wheel steps. I think for those we should go toward an approach of certainty. I am certain that I need some space. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I'm going to be flexible because balance is like the stock market. It goes up and it goes down and it goes up and it goes down. And sometimes you're a maniac. Sometimes you're a week out of a book launch. And sometimes you're in the first month of a pandemic and you don't know what to do. So there are so many places that we are going to have ambiguity. I would probably vie for more certainty. You, you bring up the jigsaw puzzle earlier, and I thought about this because I, I'm a big – like morning and evening routines kind of look like a jigsaw puzzle to me. The edge pieces, hmm. right? Like you know what the edge – you're, you're, you're mm. far more likely oh, I love to know that. what that is, right? And the middle is – and I know – I mean, uh, again, we talked about the Yukon, my wife being up in the Yukon. Well, all we had to do up there were jigsaw puzzles sometimes. So my mother-in-law and I were working on a jigsaw puzzle, and we poured it out, and we did the, the – the end pieces, the edges, the corners, all that. But then there were some, mm -hmm. you know, when you open up a jigsaw puzzle for the first time and there's like a bunch that are stuck together that are actually yeah. in the middle. And you're Be like, cheaty pieces. Yeah. yeah. But you're like, oh, good. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, this is, this is a win. Like I look at parts of the day that come together like that, that are like that. And mm. it's, it's funny because as I think like my morning, I try to do the same thing. Very small. I don't like. Austin Kleon talked about this on, on the podcast as well, but in his book, Keep Going, he talked about like portable routines, routines mm. that you could take on the road with you or things like that, that. That way there's, again, that certainty around it. And one of the things as you were talking about the idea of the, you know, you waking up in that moment, um, I have pour over coffee in the morning, every morning. Like I have a pour over machine and I, and it's not the grinding of the beans because I'm doing something during that time, but it's right. the, when I poured and I have to wait between the time when the, 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 water is going through the grinds and when the the weight is hitting the right weight on the timer so there's like this there's like this 15 to 20 second window consistently about four times where i'm just pouring and then i'm waiting and i'm pouring, and but during that time i know that there's stuff going on because i'm thought i'm thinking about these things that just show up and i think it's that certainty like it's the sustainability factor and that certainty that kind of my brain goes oh this is this is regular space i get mm. and it floods through do you think that happens too when when it happens when you've got that flexibility but there is some level of uh your brain knowing that there's space like it's oh this is where space exists here you go like do you think that happens it does happen but if you don't have a predisposition to think of space as a positive thing you'll make it go away quickly if you don't if you don't think of that as restorative or nurturing or important you'll be on your phone during every one of those 15 second breaks because you could absolutely be sitting there with LinkedIn open doing both of those things. Sure. So that philosophy of I believe the space is important, I think, is is critical. I also, you brought up something about those puzzle pieces together reminded me of kind of a beautiful image to, as we wind down, is mm -hmm. 
there was a Freakonomics podcast that talked about something called Headwinds, Tailwinds Asymmetry. Have you ever heard this? I remember seeing that episode. I don't think I've listened to it, though, but I remember seeing it in my, my podcast queue. So headwinds are the things that are against us, everything that's hard. Imagine a bicyclist going into the headwinds. Tailwinds are, oh, this feels easier for some reason. All the pu- I just dumped out four puzzle pieces, and they're all already yep, the, yep. the face of the golden retriever. <laughs> So that sense of we have an interesting quality that when bicyclists are against a headwind, they complain about it, they notice it, they feel it, they think about it all the time. And when they're with a headwind, they just think that they're a good bicyclist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and with, with the tailwind, tailwind sorry, yeah, tailwind, yeah, yeah. they don't feel that sense of support. So one of the beautiful places you can use a little improvisational space is to pay attention to tailwinds all day long. There are great things happening, supportive people, supportive accidents, supportive twists of business that we just don't pay attention to them. We pay attention to what's hard. And so that is, if you want to start giving some little candy to play with in your pauses to figure out what to think about, that that's a beautiful one to think about. The book is called A Minute to Think, Reclaim Creativity, Conquer Business, and Do Your Best Work. Juliet, thanks for joining me today. Where can people Thank pick you. up the book and where can they keep up with your work? They can buy the book anywhere that they buy books. But for us, you can come to julietfunt.com. And there, the special thing we want to offer them is they can take a test called the busyness test. Mm -hmm. And it will make a very personalized assessment of what for them uniquely is getting in the way in terms of busyness and how they can open up more room for creativity and rest. This has been fantastic. Thanks for offering that. And thanks for taking the time to have a productive conversation. with. Thank you. Thanks to Juliet for joining me again. If you want to check out everything that we talked about, you can do that in the podcast app you're using. And you can also go to productivityist.com slash podcast 398 to make that happen. The other thing you can make happen is hit the subscribe button. You can do that on the website as well, but you can easily do it on the podcast app you're using, whether it's Spotify, Overcast, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, whatever, you can subscribe to the podcast quickly and easily there, getting access to all of the archives, in a simple and quick manner, but also access to any upcoming episodes that we have. And the next episode, I'm talking to Ron Friedman. You don't want to miss that conversation because we're going to talk about decoding greatness. And again, I've talked to Ron before. I don't think we've had him on the show before, but you don't want to miss that conversation. So again, hit the subscribe button, and that's one way to support the show. The other way to support the show, there's actually a couple of ways. Ratings and reviews are always helpful. We check them out regularly. But also, support the sponsors of this podcast. You can do so by visiting productivityist.com slash podcast sponsors. There's a page for all sponsors of the podcast, including the ones that you heard about today during our conversation. That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for taking the time to join me. Until next time, I'm Mike Vardy, the host of A Productive Conversation with Mike Vardy, reminding you to stop doing productive and start being productive. See you later.